This tells the peculiar and eerie tale of a man suspected of ending his wife's life mercilessly. His accounts to law enforcement were downright surreal. Afterwards, he vanished for several years, with no one aware of his whereabouts. The tale begins with a woman named Gwen, who retrieved her children from the bus stop on October 10, 2012. On her way home, she noticed the Chadwick children awaiting their ride at the bus stop. It was quite strange because their parents were never tardy. Both boys and Gwen's children attended the same preparatory school in Ojai, California. Recognizing the family, she stopped to inquire about the delay. It was unusual for QC and Peter to neglect their duty of picking up their kids. The three brothers were ages 9, 12, and 15, with the eldest being enrolled in a different institution. The full-time homemaker and their mother, also known by her friends as QC or Kui Chu, managed their schedules with close attention to detail. The boys were her entire world and would routinely be collected from the bus stop by their father, Peter. This made it all the more peculiar to find the two youngest alone, seemingly abandoned, awaiting their bus. Their abode was situated in an exclusive, gated community where safety and security were given top priority by the residents. Gwen, upon seeing their situation, felt compelled to intervene and chose to escort them home. After several futile attempts to make contact with their parents, the youngsters remained oblivious to the chain of events unfolding at their residence, ultimately leading to a global search operation. Upon reaching their residence, Gwen, who had offered to chauffeur them, ascended the steps and rang the doorbell, only to be met with silence. Neither of the boys were in possession of a house key they had never faced such a dilemma. The unsettling discovery of the vacant premise led Gwen to take the brothers back to her own home, where she cooked them dinner. Once they finished eating, the mother attempted to reach the Chadwicks through some shared friends, but she was unsuccessful in determining their whereabouts. Consequently, her next course of action was to contact the Newport Police Department and ask for a wellness check on the family. The police arrived at the scene around 7 p.m., with no response from either Peter or his wife's phone. Peter's went to voicemail while his wife's kept ringing. Local hospitals were also contacted in case the family had visited the emergency room, but there was still no sign of them. By 7.45 p.m., the decision was made to enter the house. When the officers opened the door, they found that all the lights were off. Peter's wife was known for maintaining a spotless home, so this was unusual. Upon entering the kitchen, it appeared as though lunch preparations had been interrupted. Two plates were left on the kitchen island as if abandoned mid-process. The garage door being open was another strange observation. Continuing their search, the police officers entered the couple's bedroom and found everything looking normal. However, once they moved into the bathroom, the situation took a different turn. Upon approaching the bathtub, the officers noticed a rumpled carpet nearby. Their attention was then drawn to an overturned vase at the bathtub's edge, where shattered glass littered the area. Peering into the tub, they spotted a brownish stain accompanied by drips of a similar shade on the wall. Closer scrutiny led them to suspect the substance was blood, prompting them to handle the situation as a potential crime scene. Highly vigilant, the police considered the common occurrence of accidental breakages and injuries, which might lead someone to seek medical treatment. However, all hospitals checked earlier showed no record of the Chadwick seeking care. The search for evidence became more intensive throughout the residence, with officers also interviewing neighbors for information about the missing pair. Subsequently, both Peter and QC were registered in the missing person database, but the case wasn't over by a long shot. The authorities observed that the safe on the lower floor was ajar, and cash and precious items appeared missing. In addition, the passports of QC and her sons, typically stored in the safe, were nowhere to be found. This led to the circumstances appearing increasingly dubious. Now let's delve into the familial details. The children were remarkably proficient in their endeavors. A neighboring individual noted the boys' reputation for excelling in all they undertook, from achieving exceptional academic grades to active participation in school-based activities. Their mother was committed to providing every possible opportunity for her children by enrolling them in diverse programs. Despite QC being an individual with a systematic approach, she was known to let loose occasionally. One of the neighbors recalls how she fantasized about the annual Christmas celebration, pondering over her attire and the menu. She was perceived as a person with a warm temperament who was pleasant and comforting. In contrast, Peter was an introvert, not inclined towards social interaction. It was a common perception that he was challenging to understand due to his tendency to maintain a certain detachment from others. On the surface, the family appeared to be the picture of perfection, with the couple deeply in love and leading an ideal life. They frequently traveled overseas, as they were wealthy and had family members living in different countries. Peter hailed from the United Kingdom, while QC originated from Malaysia, 
where she was part of a large family with six siblings. QC's siblings all held master's degrees, leaving her as the only one with a bachelor's degree, which led to some insecurity. As a result, she placed great emphasis on her children's education. Peter was employed in his father's real estate development business and eventually managed an apartment complex owned by the family. Despite their wealth, the couple lived modestly, driving a Toyota minivan and a decade-old Lexus SUV. After 17 years of marriage, their love seemed as strong as ever. Let's concentrate on the case once more. The officers continued to examine the location that evening. They saw a minivan parked inside the garage, but the Lexus SUV wasn't there. The neighborhood is a safe, gated community equipped with security cameras. Authorities saw the SUV leaving the place at 1.32 p.m. through the camera footage, with no record of its return. They discovered Peter's phone had been off since 4.30 p.m. that day. QC's cell phone was in the house, charging in the restroom, beside her wedding ring and wallet. The police used helicopters to search for the SUV, also notifying the U.S. Border Patrol about the missing pair and car. Then, a strange turn of events happened. The day following the couple's disappearance, San Diego police received a 911 call from Peter. Remember that San Diego is 100 miles from the Chadwick's residence. It was discovered that the call came from a gas station just four miles from the Mexican border. Peter stated his wife was deceased and someone had taken her. Emergency, this is Crystal. Yeah, my wife, my wife's dead. Okay, so where exactly is she? They took her, they took her. Who took her? The guy broke into my house. He, he drove me here. He, he had a friend. They, they just gone. They, they've gone in a pickup truck. Okay, so your wife's dead. She's dead. Oh, they, did they, she they die killed, in the house? They, they, and they took they, her corpse. Yeah, they 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 killed killed her uh, yesterday. They killed her yesterday. Yeah, we 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 we've been driving uh, in in Newport Beach. Okay. Oh, hold on, let me get my supervisor on the phone. He said that his wife is dead, but someone broke into dead. the house and stole and uh, he, he took her. Yeah, he. he we, okay, what? He what? Found her. He, uh, I, he, Who is he? he? Um, um, Juan. 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 How do you know Juan? Uh, I. Picked him up to, to look at some painting work at the house. I brought him to the house. And when did this happen? Yesterday, middle of the day. Yesterday, in the middle of the day. And when did she die? Yesterday, middle of the day. Okay, and where is she now? Like 11. Uh, they have her body. They said they're going to cut her up. Who has her body? Juan and Chi. Okay, so when she died at 11 o'clock, they took her? Yeah, yeah. They they maybe put her in the car. We. Uh, How do you know she's dead? She drowned. She drowned. What? Her body was stiff. Even. I've been driving with them. They they say they're gonna cut her up. What's your name? Peter Chadwick. Mm -hmm. Are you on any kind of medication, sir? Not heavy one. Okay. I, it's not bad. Okay. Because I, I think they're going, uh, they might be going to Mexico or somewhere. Okay, but this happened yesterday at 11. You're now calling us at 5.30 in the morning. I know. I, I want you to get him. Huh? Yeah. They're here. Okay, go talk to him. He relayed to the dispatcher that an intruder had forced him and his spouse into their own truck, driven them to San Diego, and then tossed him from the vehicle. When queried about the whereabouts of his wife by the dispatcher, he just stated over and over that she wasn't alive. When asked about the cause of death, his response became stammered. He claimed her death occurred a day prior and that they had been on the move ever since. Throughout the call, the dispatcher was visibly puzzled. Post this call, he was met by two police officers at a fuel station and narrated his bizarre tale. Before the day, at 11 at night, Peter was busy at one of his ancestral lands. Amidst all the renovations, suddenly, a man known as Juan approached Chadwick, seeking if there was work available. Peter said the crew was whole and no extra help was needed. However, if the need was dire, he directed Juan toward a small project at his home. Juan agrees and brings the man back to his Newport Beach home, where he shows the worker a railing that has to be replaced on the interior circular staircase. He heads upstairs to his office, leaving Juan to finish the work. He claims that he hears his wife crying a little while later. 
He followed the sound into the bedroom and then into the bathroom to investigate. Next, Peter claims to have witnessed Juan choking and holding his wife down by the neck while, ostensibly, the woman was submerged in the tub's water. Tell us, would you take a bath without locking the door if an unknown man was working in your home? We find this to be strange. Is Peter being honest? According to reports, Peter tries to stop him, but the man is too powerful and threatens Chadwick with a pocket knife. Then, when Peter was delivering the tale, he cut directly to the part where the weird guy killed his wife, noting that the blade of the pocket knife was not that sharp. Peter Chadwick continued by saying that he was compelled to place his wife's body in the back of his SUV after wrapping it in a blanket. In addition, Juan gives him instructions to retrieve passports, jewelry, and $10,000 in cash. The killer then gets into the Lexus SUV and gives the captive the order to drive while threatening to stab him. Peter then goes on to inform the officers that he begged the man to allow him to bury his wife while he was driving, but Juan had him drive for hours on end without stopping. When Juan speaks with his friend on the phone while driving, Peter is wholly lost in Spanish and cannot understand a word that Juan says. After a while, Juan signals to Peter to halt the vehicle. After Chadwick stops, the two wait for the friend of the murderer to show up. The friend's name was Chi. Chi pulled up in a green Chevy pickup. After taking the money and possessions, they placed the body into the truck and left Peter inside. However, they gave him instructions to stay at the gas station until they phoned and told him what to do next before they left, if he desired to reclaim his wife's body at all. After a short while, Peter went into the petrol station and asked the attendant if he might use the phone to dial 911. According to the police officers who showed up there to meet him, the man didn't even inquire about his son's welfare. To them, this appeared to be a warning sign. Upon hearing Peter's account, they searched his car and discovered a men's clothing suitcase. The luggage seemed disorganized, suggesting Peter had packed it quickly. When Chadwick saw that the police had located it, he informed them that the killer had requested that he pack a bag. Now why would Juan ask his prisoner to do this? Were they taking a holiday? Five hours later, following more inquiry, they took Peter into custody. When they got to the station, they took the standard pictures of Chadwick in mugshots. While doing this, they saw that the man had several scratches on his neck and body. They discovered that the wounds did not match the account he gave. They did not appear to be the wounds an attacker would cause. Actually, they resembled a victim's self-defense wounds. Chadwick had claimed at the station that Juan's pocket knife had caused the scratches, but the man was obviously lying. One other deception was that Juan lied to Peter by immobilizing him for five minutes as he sat on his chest preventing him from doing CPR on his strangled wife. During the interrogation, the police officers found it odd that Chadwick took so many long pauses before answering. His frequently covering part of his face with his hands made them believe even more that he was lying about everything he was saying to them. At this point, no one ever saw Peter in the company of another person, not at the gas station, not at the job site, not at his house. It would come across as weird because the man clearly stated he was in the company of someone named Juan, but Peter had something to say about that. He told the police officers that Juan was always in the back seat, and that's why he wasn't seen. Things were still being determined as to what happened. Still, the police had one very intriguing lead they needed to follow. Peter did run into a police officer that very day when everything happened. This run-in occurred as he returned to his house, presumably with Juan, to fix his stairs. Peter said that he pulled over to call his wife about lunch. Then, a police officer came to his car to tell him he couldn't park in that spot on the highway. So, the detectives needed to track down this officer who saw Peter. Thankfully, they could speak with the patrol officer in charge of the highway that day after making numerous calls. When they spoke with him, the man stated that he had looked all over the car and had not seen the driver with anyone else. In other words, while Peter claimed to be driving home with Juan in the back seat, he was by himself. QC vanished, and despite a ton of evidence suggesting Peter was the person who took her, the officers were still clueless about her whereabouts after a week of searching. They began looking around some San Diego suburbs but could not locate her. Some vast, undeveloped land plots were nearby where a detective and a few deputies met. After dividing up, they all began to explore the area. One deputy arrived at the property after going in a different path than the others. There was a massive iron gate around the house and a big dumpster next to the gate. As he draws nearer, he begins to detect an awful smell. Even though the man was highly apprehensive, he opened the garbage can lid and removed some of the rubbish before something drew his attention. Wrapped around anything was a green blanket. 
When the man set it aside, what appeared before his eyes startled him. When QC's body was eventually discovered, it was concealed in a dumpster in the middle of nowhere, wrapped in a blanket. However, one of the cops had a memory of something. In that dumpster, there were other bodies than this one. Oddly, they had discovered another one there the year prior. Another fact is that the house's owners were acquitted of any involvement with the first body found in their dumpster. The family moved out of their home for a while after that horrifying tragedy. The odd coincidence is that QC's body was discovered in the same dumpster right after they returned to the residence. The coincidences, however, don't end here. Every Thursday, the garbage man would normally empty the dumpster. Wednesday is when Peter hid the body. He may or may not have realized that. Therefore, the business should have removed the rubbish the following day, and QC's body might not have been discovered. The family who occupied the property appears to have had a falling out with the garbage company, so they never showed up to take it out. In conclusion, the family's failure to pay their bills and their poor relationship with the garbage disposal firm were the only factors contributing to the discovery of the poor woman's death. It was something completely unconnected that allowed the cops to find QC's body. Things started to come together when the investigators began examining the nature of the interaction between them and her after they located her. When police searched QC's home, they discovered a message among her belongings. It read, from Pete's computer, and included a list detailing Pete's search history beneath it. Chadwick appeared to have searched up some odd and unsettling stuff. He looked up information on Chinese massage girls, escort girls' divorces, the reason behind abortions in California, and one very noteworthy topic, how to torture. This information is obviously highly alarming. Subsequently, the police learned through the couple's friends that there had been discussions about divorce within the marriage. And the reason for this was QC's claim that her husband paid her no attention. Rumors circulated that he was having an affair with his spouse. When their friends discovered what QC had looked up on his computer, they asked her why she didn't leave her husband. However, it seems that she was too preoccupied with the lives and welfare of her kids to take the time to consider her own pleasure. Thus, the judge imposes a $1 million bond while the person is in detention. Naturally, Chadwick, who is extremely wealthy, pays the price and gets out. For two years, Years, the trial continues. The dad shows up for hearings, is helpful, and goes to see his kids, who were living with some relatives at the time, and it doesn't seem like anything is stuck with him. After the police had thoroughly inspected the Lexus SUV, he could reclaim it. The only thing Peter does outside the house when he visits his father in Santa Barbara is drive to Orange County for court appearances. However, on January 16, 2015, an unexpected event occurred. Peter failed to appear in court, and this particular session aimed to determine the points the jury would consider when making its verdict. The police announced that they would issue a $250,000 warrant for the man's arrest if he failed to show up for the second court session after noticing his absence. Since his lawyer and family didn't know where he was, they were concerned and assumed he had committed suicide. As the authorities began hunting for evidence of Peter's whereabouts, they discovered that his bank accounts had been emptied. Peter then seized all his possessions, including his trust funds, leaving his children without money. When the detectives went through Chadwick's house again, they discovered some intriguing literature. They talked of living off the grid and assuming a different identity, and that pretty much confirmed what they thought the man would do. It became apparent that before his disappearance, he had begun to do trial travels to go beyond the parameters of his court order without running afoul of the law. Although it was against the law for him to leave California then, he continued. He allegedly traveled to Pennsylvania, Missouri, and Seattle, but was never apprehended. This proved that he was not monitored well at all. The police discovered from a taxi company that an individual traveled in a cab from Peter's father's home to an airport in Santa Barbara. Interestingly, the taxi driver claimed the passenger was a woman, making everyone think it wasn't Peter. However, they later obtained security footage from the airport that revealed Peter's presence. This caused the authorities to believe he had disguised himself as a woman to avoid detection before reaching his destination. In the security footage, Peter waited at the airport for hours without further activity. After some time, he left the airport, disappearing from sight. Although Peter had vanished, the police continued their investigation. Almost five years later, they found a crucial lead leading to Peter in Mexico. In August 2019, he was brought back to the United States, a success that was attributed to the police's close relationship with Mexican authorities. You might be curious about what Peter was doing during this period. With millions of dollars at his disposal, Chadwick lived a luxurious life in Mexico. He stayed in five-star hotels and spent his money extravagantly for enjoyment. However, a new law was introduced in the country, leading to his capture. 
The Mexican government required all foreign guests residing in luxury hotels to present their passports during check-in. Peter, however, could not comply with this rule owing to an outstanding warrant in his name. This predicament forced Peter to opt for more modest lodgings like hostels and motels. Peter also resorted to earning a livelihood via sporadic jobs, possibly to preserve his finances and ensure a steady income stream. He even used aliases like Paul Cook and John Franklin to circumvent his recognition. When eventually caught and extradited to the United States, he was taken into custody. Currently, he is undergoing trials, and if convicted of his wife's murder, Peter faces anything from a 25-year jail term to life imprisonment. So the question remains, did he actually murder his wife? And was there indeed a character named Juan involved in any of this? Please share your thoughts.